It has been a big week in federal politics, with Treasurer Josh Frydenberg handing down his fourth budget on Tuesday night. I'm Kate Griffiths, Deputy Director of Grattan's Budgets and Government Program, and I'll be hosting today's special episode on the federal budget. We are joined by Grattan CEO, Danielle Wood, who is in Canberra for all the action. Welcome, Danielle. Thanks for having me, Kate. So I happen to know budget season is your favourite time of year. What makes it so exciting? It is indeed. I think some people call it Economist Christmas and, and it's exciting for us because everyone's talking about economics for at least one day of the year. It's actually exciting because it's important. Um, it touches all of our lives. It's the sort of once a year when the government updates Australians on the economic outlook uh, and articulates their policy vision for, for the year and, and multiple years ahead. So the good thing about the budget is it's not just talk, it has to be backed by concrete initiatives. We can see them there in the budget paper. Uh, and so we get the insights, you know, what's going to be happening to tax? Um, where's the government going to be pursuing new initiatives? Um, where are they cutting back on spending? So really, if, if you want to understand the economic direction the government's taking, it is the most important year night of the year to tune in. Heading into this budget, there were obviously some pretty significant economic challenges. The Russian invasion of Ukraine, the floods in New South Wales and Queensland. We have cost of living pressures off the back of a pandemic. And now there are growing fears of inflation too. Did the government adequately respond to all those pressures in the budget? Look, it is, it's a very unusual set of influences. Um, my sense was that the government was a little bit unsure of how to respond and, and to walk the line, and, and particularly when that comes layered with um, an election coming up. So it creates this very um, unusual and potent mix. And we can come back to the, the floods. But broadly, despite those kind of external shocks that you were pointing to there, um, the overall strength of the economy, I think, is looking much better than, than anyone anticipated at, at this point. Um, unemployment at 4%, you know, forecast to have a three in front of it in the next three months. You know, that is extraordinary, lowest in 50 years. And when it's combined with an increase in participation, you know, I think that is unambiguously good news. Um, the budget numbers certainly suggest the good news is going to continue. They're, they're talking about consumer spending at five and three quarter percent next year, business investment at nine percent. Um, so you can quibble with individual forecasts, but I think you know the overall picture, which I think is right, is is an economy with a healthy level of demand. So um, first of all, we should give credit where it's due. I think you know a lot of this is because of the fiscal strategy that the government's adopted really supporting the economy during COVID, targeting low, low unemployment, um, and that's really yielded benefits. The challenge, on the other hand, is that that's not necessarily being felt by all households. So we've got inflation estimated to reach 4.5% this year. That Those external shocks that you were talking about, um, you know, Russian invasions fed into high oil price, high, fuel, uh, high food prices, same with the floods. Um, and wage growth isn't keeping up with that. So that's really where that kind of imperative to do something on the cost of living front comes from. Um, how have they managed it? My sense is that they've overplayed the cost of living support angle. Um, and I think, you know, that was the overwhelming consideration that, that seemed to be there given it was a pre-election budget. Uh, the risk, of course, is if you're adding to demand in the economy, you further push up inflation you make it more likely that the Reserve Bank has to move earlier on interest rates, which, of course, also has an impact on household budgets. Uh, and really, when I look at the size of the, um, the amount of, or when I look at the amount of money that they're pumping in, um, the low and middle income tax offset now supercharged up to $1,500 per household hitting the economy from July. We've got the $250 um, payments for welfare recipients. Overall, you, you end up adding in about 1.3% of GDP over the next six months. And that's on par with um, the Rudd government's first stimulus package to respond to the GFC. Uh, and that's happening in, a, in an economy that's going pretty well. So look, it, it's, it's kind of, um, it's an unusual as, as an overall package. Um, I'm, yeah, I'm concerned about the impact on inflation and I'm concerned about doing something so big when we're already running a big structural deficit. There was a package for the floods though, right? Tell us a bit about that. They've already announced a lot of it, but in total they're expecting the whole thing will will cost about $6 billion. So some of that's the kind of emergency supports, um, some of that's the rebuilding on the other side, and obviously it's kind of uncertain how big that will be yet, but this is obviously a very 
sizable package. Um, and I think that is worth noting because it's obviously really important for those communities that are doing it really tough. Um, it does also, though, point to um, longer term rising fiscal costs from, from managing uh, more severe and, and more frequent natural disasters. And um, for those that haven't seen it, I would recommend an um, excellent um, Grattan piece that, that Kate wrote alongside um, Alison Reeve, our Deputy Program Director for our Climate and Energy Program, that looks at some of the budget costs of, of climate change. Thanks for spruiking my piece, Danny. So, yeah, that big picture is really that we've seen a couple of years of big spending to support the COVID recovery, and that's that's really been a success story. But this year, maybe the cash splash has gone a little too far. We'll have to see. Budget time is always a whirlwind of announcements, and you've mentioned a few of the things there in that response, in particular the low and middle income tax offset. But what are the, the big new things in this budget? So the single biggest was the, the low and middle income tax offset increase. Um, there was the fuel excise cut, um, 22.1 cents a litre for the next six months. Uh, not to be sneezed out in itself, $3 billion, um, very big. And, you know, you have to think it's going to be really hard for someone in six months' time to, to unwind that. So I think there's sort of concerns over both the, the scale and, and form of that. Um, there is a, a sizable package for skills reform, $2.6 billion over five years. Um, like a number of things in this budget, it's kind of unclear exactly what's in there. Um, we know there's going to be some cash payments to people doing um, traineeships in priority trades, uh, but as of budget night, there wasn't a list yet of, of what those priority areas would be. There is sizable money. It's not new money, but $3.7 billion that the government's committed to um, once they sign up a new national skills agreement with the state. So they are putting increasing emphasis on, on skills. Also some pretty significant money for the, the COVID winter response plan. So another $2.5 billion or so. That's around um, rapid tests, uh, vaccine, testing, PPE, given what we know is the enormous personal but also economic benefits of keeping the virus in check, um, that's it, it's good to see that they're investing in and looking forward on that particular issue. There was very little in the way of savings in this budget and I just kind of went through trying to see if there was anything sizable, which there really wasn't, but they are estimating another $1.5 billion over four years through beefing up uh, the ATO Tax Avoidance Task Force, uh, which is going to be really cracking down on, on things like trusts and, and other ways in which high net worth individuals try and minimise tax. So that's a pretty big overview of the, um, the main things hitting the bottom line. Uh, we know there was also a bunch of new investment for various kinds of infrastructure, regional infrastructure, transport infrastructure, dams, etc., out there too. And in fact, in dollar terms, I think some of that is, is a fair bit bigger uh, but this combination of, you know, cash handouts, more transport infrastructure, cheaper petrol, you know, is this what Australians need right now? Um, or is this just the standard playbook for a pre-election budget? Look, I mean, I think so clearly that kind of cost of living package that you mentioned, the tax offsets, the petrol excise cuts are, are very much done with an eye to the election. Um, and you're absolutely right that, you know, I didn't mention them because they're outside of the, or they stretch over a longer period than the forward estimates, but there's some mammoth commitments in terms of transport infrastructure spending, defence spending, um, the kind of regional package, which looks like it was um, the price that uh, we, we paid to get the nationals over the line for, for net zero. I have some significant concerns about committing that much money um, done in a lot of case a lot of cases without much oversight. Um, so when we look at the list of the sort of 18 billion worth of transport projects that have been announced, um, you know, not many of them are on the Infrastructure Australia priority list. Uh, very few of them even have a business case. Uh, and we know from the excellent work of, of Grattan's um, transport program that that is a big risk factor for, for cost overruns and, and projects that don't stack up. Uh, and when you combine that with the fact that we already have a really full pipeline of transport infrastructure projects in this country, um, you know, so much so that we've got state treasurers, you know, kind of wringing their hands over the fact that we're seeing the price of materials go up, we're seeing the price of key labour go up, where, you know, it's difficulty even accessing key machinery. It just doesn't seem to make a lot of economic sense to me to be pumping 
all this additional money into that pipeline. So I, I don't know what the motivation was there. You know, I don't think there is a good economic case for it. Um, so again, I think you can probably only conclude that it was done with an election in mind. So you mentioned that there was um, sort of conspicuous lack of savings in this budget. Uh, what are the other kind of big things that, that are not in this budget? I think um, the lack of action on the climate transition was was really the, the big one for me. Um, we know that, you know, what we do in the next decade is going to be absolutely crucial um, if we're going to have any chance of making net zero by 2050 and, and, and doing it without, you know, significant disruptive kind of change through the 2040s um, to the 2030s and 40s. Um, so, you know, I, I'm i disappointed that we're not seeing policies set out that are going to help us get there. So things that our Grattan colleagues have spent a lot of time talking about, emission ceilings for, for light vehicles to speed up the transition to EVs, um, ramping up the safeguard mechanism for industrial emissions, uh, leadership around um, the investments that are needed for the, the national energy grid to, to, to um, deal with the big influx of renewables. Uh, so it was it was pretty silent on those fronts. Um, there was some money around the green transition in regional areas, so billion or so to expand low emissions technology capabilities such as green hydrogen. Um, you know that that is absolutely to be welcomed. Uh, we need to make sure that the money is allocated well, and there's good processes around where that gets spent, so we don't just see another sort of set of pork barrels around those types of funds. But, I, you know, I think you know we should recognise that there are some good things in there. The other area where I think it's a big missed opportunity is women's workforce participation. Uh, you know, now is the time. We have tight labour markets. Governments are looking for things that are going to drive future productivity and growth, really making it more affordable for women that want to participate in the workforce to do so by reducing out-of-pocket Childcare costs uh, would be very high on my list, which won't be a surprise to anyone. And the government had done some things that came into effect in March. It has reduced some of the worst problems, but there's still a long way to go. There were some changes to paid parental leave. Initially, I got excited seeing that because that's, I think, another really important piece of the puzzle on women's workforce participation. But the changes that were introduced, which was essentially to combine the 18 weeks government paid parental leave for the primary carer two weeks down in partner pay that, that families get access to at the moment into a single 20-week allocation for the whole family um, actually risks in a lot of families, I think, the woman taking the full 20 weeks uh, and, and dad's really not, and dad's being, you know, if anything, less involved in that crucial early year. Why does that matter for workforce participation? Well, when we look around the world where the trend has been to be actually making leave entitlements more generous, and setting aside a component of leave for dads and partners, you know, that's what really drives men to take up that leave when you have this, you know, a four weeks, five weeks, six weeks, six months in some cases, use it or lose it component for dads and partners. Then they start to be involved in the early years. We can see that they stay more actively involved in, in care of those children in later years, and that frees up women to participate more in the workforce. So that's an, actually a really important lever for cultural change around some of these gendered norms. So I do fear that that will be a backward step. Yeah, it was disappointing to see there was no actual extra parental leave in the parental leave announcement, um, and particularly when it was the centrepiece of the government's package to improve women's economic security. Indeed. I mean, the only, actually, the one thing I would say is, um, the good thing is that single parents will get the 20 weeks rather than the 18. So that was a, a some small benefit. A step in the right direction there. So beyond the announcements, uh, the budget also gives us a peek into the future on government finances. In this particular budget, you know, what did we learn about the federal government's finances over, over the meeting? In the short term, I think the good news is that, you know, despite the significant ramp up of, of debt during COVID, um, low interest rates um, have meant that interest payments as a share of the economy uh, have basically been stable through and, and going to continue to be stable. We see debt starting to, well, actually peaking in the final year of the forward estimates, 2025-26, um, and sort of stabilising as a share of the economy at that point of time. But we do face this kind of longer-term structural budget challenge. So we are coming out of COVID with significantly higher spending than we went in with, about 26.5% of GDP. For those people that are really paying attention, you may recall at the last election, the government was telling us we'd only be spending 24.9% of GDP by the end of this decade. So it was a really 
big difference in government as a share of the economy than than where we were told we were going to be. On top of that, you know, you need to layer in longer term challenges like ageing population, like like climate, um, all of which put sizable pressure on the that kind of longer term budget position. Uh, at the same time, government's saying that they want to keep taxes capped at 23.9% of GDP. Um, so you can see in the um, the medium term estimates in the budget, you know, there are there's a structural budget deficit each and every year over the next decade. Um, I'm worried that those pressures are only going to get larger. You know, I, I, I would, you know, like to see more talk about what we do to kind of grow the economy. Uh, I think we should be looking at trying to constrain spending. And, and that is why, you know, when I see uh, tens of billions getting thrown around in a budget like this without a business case, that, that makes me feel a bit frustrated. Uh, and I think we need to have a conversation around taxes in the longer term as well. And, you know, certainly we shouldn't just manage this by kind of blindly letting income tax creep up. Um, we need to be thinking more broadly. Uh, that might mean looking at consumption taxes, it might mean looking at um, taxes on, on wealth. Uh, you know, we probably should be looking at leakages or, or, or tax concessions, which are narrowing the income tax base. So things like the capital gains tax discount, um, super tax concessions in retirement, family trusts, you know, I think they should all be on the table when we're trying to look at this kind of long term structural picture. Just one final question then. Given this was a pre-election budget, what are the big things the next government, whether it be coalition or Labor, will need to, to grapple with? And I think you've just started touching there on tax reform. It sounds like that might be one of the big things that's left to future governments to consider. Yeah, look, it's kind of it's it's been out of vogue for quite a while now. And you know, really we we haven't had much in the way of substantial tax reform over the past 20 years. Uh, but more generally, I mean, I, I would say um, that sort of productivity agenda in the broad will be really important. Um, and, it, you know, that does go beyond tax reform. It's, you know, there are big opportunities for reform in government services, in, in education and in health. And, um, you know, I always love to see the work that's coming out of Grattan in these areas because there, there are things that we can actually do. There are policies that are sitting there that would make a real difference in these areas if if people are willing to take them on. Um, we've talked about women's workforce participation. There's opportunities around um, the way cities work and particularly reforming um, planning laws, which, which are actually really important productivity policies and I think may need federal government to come in and think about incentives to, to help states do those things, which are politically hard. Um, we've done a lot of work on the composition of the migration program and the differences that could make. So if people want to go and have a look at our orange book, which does set out the kind of more full policy agenda, but there, there is a lot in the way of things that governments can do around productivity and, and pro-growth policies. The other thing I think I would like to see is a, sort of an emphasis on how do we actually make government work better and how do we increase the the chances of good decision making in the public interest i know these are issues dear to your heart kate um but you know can we tackle lobbying and political donations reform um can we get better processes to reduce waste of taxpayers money through things like pork barreling uh can we build public service capability and reduce outsourcing of expertise you know i think if we did something in that space as well you know all of that's going to put us in a better place to make those um sort of economic and social reforms, which are going to be able to improve the lives of, of all Australians. Absolutely. Uh, budgets, at the very least, give us a moment in the political calendar to have these sorts of important conversations. So we've covered a lot of ground today. Thank you for sharing your expertise with us, Danielle. For our listeners, if you'd like to learn more about Grattan Institute's research, all our work is freely available on our website at grattan.edu.au. You can subscribe to our podcast and newsletter on our website or follow us on Twitter at Grattan Inst and all other social media at Grattan Institute. Our budget analysis is freely available thanks to the donations of listeners like you. Please consider making a regular or one-off donation at grattan.edu.au forward slash donate. And thank you for joining me today.